So I'll have Tom take it away. Okay. Thanks, Katrina. Thanks, everybody, for joining tonight. Uh, this topic's been on my mind for a decade or more now. Um, I went out to college in Binghamton, New York, and lived out there for 12 years. And uh, in that time, became aware of the other places in New York State that the Palatine Germans settled in, the Schoharie Valley, uh, the Mohawk Valley, and down into Pennsylvania as well, to the Hocken area. Uh, so I've kept a, a running list on paper, you know, as I learned about the Palatines and uh, become aware of the, the wider story, not just the, the Germantown end of things. And uh, I've kept a list all these years and uh, flushed it out a little bit. And that's all I'll be talking about tonight. Uh, the image I have on the screen there, those are uh, the books that Henry Z. Jones Jr. Uh, the, the leading genealogist of the Palatine German migration. Uh, he donated all of those books to the New York State chapter of the Palatines to America, as well as the Germantown Library. And uh, there they sit upstairs at the Germantown Library uh, as we speak. Uh, they're open to the public the same hours that the library is open uh, Tuesday through Saturday. And um, the books are all cataloged now. We're still going through some of the papers and periodicals that Hank uh, donated, uh, but it's a great resource and uh, came in very handy researching this, this topic. And uh, it's open to the public. So please, if you're interested in anywhere nearby, uh, make a trip to Germantown Library and make use of that collection. We'll start with Conrad Weiser. Uh, this is son of Johann Conrad Weiser. As far as I know, that's the, the only likeness drawn of a 1710 Palatine that was done while he was living. Uh, the artist who did that drew that from actually looking at Conrad Weiser. Now, um, the father, his father, Johann Conrad Weiser, was one of the 1710ers. Conrad was a, a young boy in 1710 when he came to East Camp. Um, Johann Conrad Weiser was among the volunteers uh, that in 1711 that went up to uh, fight in the British army against uh, French Canada. Uh, they got turned around before the, you know, the conflict simmered down before they actually got all the way up to Canada. And uh, conditions were really not good in the camps, uh, especially in East Camp. Um, and conditions were really bad when so many of the men went on that military expedition. They came back and they found their families in even, even more destitute and squalid conditions uh, than they were when they left. And Johann Conrad Weiser, was among the uh, among the leaders of um, the, the more rebellious faction of the Palatines in East Camp, and he was also you know among the leaders of uh, the Palatines who went out to Schoharie in the late 1712 when Governor Hunter uh, pulled funding for the tar making project in East Camp. Uh, Conrad Weiser, the son, here. Uh, in his autobiography, uh, he mentioned uh, the following winter, meaning the following winter after arriving. So either 17, winter of 1710 into 11 or the uh, winter of 1711 into 1712. Um, he writes, that is to say in December of that year, my youngest brother, uh, Johann Friedrich died in about the sixth year of his age and was buried in Livingston's bush. And uh, that topic that we, at the history department, we tossed that around a lot. What, the, what did he mean by Livingston's bush? Um, the, so the first church building in East Camp was on today's Sharps Landing Road, just inside the Northern Bend of Sharps Landing Road and that building uh, it was built by Reverend Hager and shared by 
his congregation and uh, the Lutherans as well. And to me, that seems the likeliest uh, candidates right in the camp where the Wisers lived, Queensbury. And, uh, you yeah, know, no other, it's possible that could, Livingston's Bush could be referring to uh, an area up near the manor house, near the mouth of the Rojan. But uh, it's really hard to say just from that oblique reference in Conrad Weiser's autobiography. Uh, Conrad Weiser went with his family uh, out to Schoharie uh, when he was 15 or so years old in 1712. And then when he was a little bit older, a teenager, he went to live with the Mohawk Indians for a time. And uh, from that time, he was very skilled in the Mohawk language and uh, really made a career out of being a negotiator between Mohawk Indians and, and other Indians as well. He was, uh, he was really a bridge to several different worlds in colonial America. Uh, the Palatine Germans, he could speak German, he could speak English, he could speak uh, Mohawk and other Indian languages as well. Um, the Wisers, generally speaking, Conrad, his father, and later Wisers, all heavily involved in the Lutheran Church after they made their way to Tulpahop in Pennsylvania. Uh, they spent uh, several years in the Schoharie Valley and that they're, they're among the detachment of Palatines that went and settled in the Tulpahawk and Orange County area of Pennsylvania. Um, Conrad Weiser there on the screen, is also a colonel during the French and Indian Wars towards the end of his life. Uh, is one of the founders of Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, he ran a pretty large farm down there in Pennsylvania, also ran a tannery and um, his daughter, one of his daughters married uh, Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, who is considered the father of the Lutheran church in, in colonial America in the early United States. One of Conrad Weiser's uh, great grandsons was a man named Peter M. Weiser. He was part of the Corps of Discovery, also known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Um, he doesn't uh, doesn't reflect very well in the journals. Not not terrible, but uh, the first reference to him in the journals that Meriwether Lewis and William Clark kept of the expedition, first reference to him is that he's drunk. Uh, this is before they even left St. Louis to go up the Missouri into uncharted territory. Um, another, again, before they even left St. Louis, he was among three, among four members of the Corps of Discovery who were disciplined for disorderly conduct. And uh, the sentence was they couldn't leave camp for 10 days. And um, uh, he was on the expedition itself. He was uh, served as a quartermaster, served as a cook oftentimes. And he also went on uh, several hunting expeditions. And um, in January 1806, so when they're out um, on the Pacific coast in uh, today's Oregon, um, he, went, <clears throat> he went on an expedition with Alexander Willard, another Corps Discovery member, to uh, the, the mission was they would find a way to make salt so that they could preserve the meat that they were hunting for on the Pacific coast there. And uh, they stayed out at least six days beyond when they were expected to return. And um, Clark wrote in one of his journals, January 1806, that he was worried about them and didn't think that they would return. And then the, later in 1806, July 1806, when they're already well on their way back to St. Louis, he pops up in the journals again because he cut his leg with a knife so badly that he couldn't walk for several days. And uh, the other very interesting thing about Peter M. Weiser is he, he among many other core discovery members, went back out west after uh, they came back 
to St. Louis later in 1806. Um, he went on an expedition out west with uh, the Spanish fur trapper Manuel Lisa and several other members of the fur discovery. He's last documented alive in 1810. And then William Clark made a list of the core discovery. And if he knew they were dead, he would write deceased. And when Clark made that list in 1825, Weiser's listed as dead. Um, nobody really knows what happened to him, but there is, I think he may have been killed by Blackfeet Indians on one of those expeditions with Manuel Lisa. Uh, the next Palatine I'd like to talk about is General Nicholas Herkimer. And uh, he, uh, very famous uh, part of American Revolutionary War history. Um, his family was among the first, possibly the first uh, family to get to uh, the area on the Mohawk River uh, around Little Falls. And the family out there, the Herkimer family, they, uh, what they did was they set up a portage service, basically around Little Falls. Um, before the Erie Canal existed, uh, small boats called pirogues uh, would ply the Hudson River, the Mohawk River, and then there was a one mile portage near it, Fort Stanwix to get into Wood Creek. And then from Wood Creek, uh, the boats would float down, uh, meet Oneida Lake, and then follow the river system, Seneca, Oswego rivers um, to Lake Ontario. So it was a very arduous journey. It's even more arduous than the canal itself. The canal was a great improvement on the system. But in Herkimer's time, uh, the journey was so arduous that oftentimes people just wouldn't want to go any further. If they came up the Hudson and you know, up the Mohawk around Cohoes Falls and then all the way up to Little Falls. Oftentimes they're so exhausted from the journey they would just want to sell whatever they had on the boat and go back uh, where they came from. And uh, this gave, you know, the leverage involved in that, you know, oftentimes people would sell or whatever they had on the boat at a, you know, even either dead even or even at a loss. So the Herkimer family very quickly became very wealthy, very prominent people out there in the Mohawk Valley in the area of Little Falls. And um, when the war came um, in 1777, uh, the strategy of the British Army uh, the grand strategy was to send a detachment up the Hudson River and send a detachment uh, from Lake Ontario through that uh, convoluted system of waterways that I mentioned, and also send um, a detachment coming down Lake Champlain and then the Hudson River. And the intention was to all converge in the middle of today's New York State and basically cut the state into multiple pieces. And um, as part of that campaign, uh, British general by the name of St. Ledger, uh, Barry St. Ledger, uh, approached uh, from Lake Ontario and Battle of Oriskany was uh, the result. Uh, Herkimer had underneath, under his command, he had uh, commanded the Tryon County militia um, and some very large percentage, 80, maybe 90% of his militia were uh, descendants of the Palatine German migration. Um, many, many other Palatine families um, went to Schoharie and then a pretty sizable detachment also went on to the Mohawk Valley after some time in the Schoharie. Uh, very well represented in that army were uh, Petries, the Petri family. Uh, General Herkimer's mother was a Petri. So he had, he had many 
relatives from his mother's side in that uh, in that militia with him. You know, his one of his brothers, Johann Joost Herkimer, uh, was a loyalist, a very prominent loyalist. So in that family, not so much the Petries, but in the Herkimer family and in many other families in the Mohawk Valley, there were divided loyalties. Uh, it was especially on the frontier there, it was it was very questionable which way the war was going to go. And uh, it was it was truly a civil war out there in the Mohawk Valley. Um, the reason uh, General Herkimer is pointing there, uh, so he's wounded in the leg pretty grievously in the lower leg in the early stages of the Battle of Oriskany. There's a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat in uh, the Battle of Oriskany. You know, they're using, uh, you know, all these guys are using muskets. Um, there's a lot of, you know, fighting with knives, bayonets. Uh, you only get one shot off in conditions like this and took quite a while to reload. So oftentimes they shoot once and then charge in with bayonets. And then occasionally even, even reduce to just fist fighting at times. And uh, the early stages of that battle did not go very well for the Tryon County militia. Uh, but Herkimer is credited with rallying the, rallying his militia and directing the order of battle. Uh, even though he couldn't walk, he was perched up against a the tree there. Uh, that's one of the very few original pictures of mine in this uh, in this presentation. Unlike most presentations I do I'm at the mercy of other institutions, photo galleries, because there's really not a whole lot in the in the Germantown History Department archive related to what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, but that's a picture I took uh, several years ago now when I was uh, visiting the battlefield at Ariston. Uh, that's General Herkimer's house. Now, after the battle, um, they couldn't find the, the surgeon for the militia regiment. Uh, one of uh, Herkimer's cousins, uh, Petri. Um, so he was, he was brought back to his house some good distance away, uh, several miles. And um, he lingered there for about 10 days, I believe it was, and um, finally amputated uh, his lower leg that had been injured so grievously at the battle. And it uh, really wasn't done very well. And uh, he ended up passing away within, you know, shortly after the amputation. And uh, there at his house, um, there, there is a chest at the foot of one of the beds in, upstairs in that room. And the story is that that chest came along for the ride when, during the Palatine migration in 1710. Uh, this is one of the, you know, George Washington slept here is a is a running gag, but it's actually true. In the case of this house, uh, General Washington did come to visit uh, Herkimer's widow uh, in the year several years after uh, after the Battle of Oriskany. So I mean, the the net effect of the Battle of Oriskany is that it slowed down St. Ledger's forces coming uh, down the Mohawks towards Albany on the Mohawk River, and um, it. it was a grievous loss for the uh, for the Tryon County militia. They really got chewed up. This was it's it's almost it's impossible to really estimate the number of dead. But some of the figures that get thrown out are 500, 600 uh, people dead on the field. Very lopsided uh, battle. Uh, the British forces and the their Indian allies um, really tore up the Tryon County militia. Uh, this battle, but it did slow St. Ledger's forces down, and it did it did pull St. Ledger's force out of Fort Stanwix, and uh, another contingent of uh, Continental troops under uh, Marinus Willett uh, were able to. They went into St Fort Stanwix during the battle, and basically uh, destroyed everything of value in the fort. So it wasn't 
a total strategic loss for the you know, for the continental side. The Herkimer is remembered as the hero of Ariskany. And uh, that's a shot, that, that's his house on the left-hand corner there, um, Erie Canal bike pathway is uh, in the foreground, uh, just a little beyond uh, the fence there. And then even further in the distance is the Mohawk River slash Erie Canal and a uh, railroad line just beyond there. Um, so you can see Herkimer, this is some distance from Little Falls where his, his father made a lot of the family wealth by running that portage site around Little Falls. That it's a good distance away, but it's still very centrally located on that, that transportation corridor. Uh, Nicholas Herkimer, uh, to get to his parents, his parents were little kids, maybe about 10 or so years old uh, during the 1710 migration. Um, his father was um, George uh, Hirschheimer. And um, he lived in Hunterstown. Excuse me, his grandfather is George Hirschheimer. Uh, grandmother's Magdalena Hirschheimer. They lived in Hunterstown, which is today's Chevy of Hamlet in Germantown. And um, by 1716, 1717, uh, they're out in the Schoharie Valley, uh, where they didn't stay too long. They were, they were among the very first ones that went to the Mohawk Valley in the, in the years shortly after that. Uh, Nicholas Herkimer's uh, mother, Anna Katharina Petri, uh, was also at East Camp. She was in the Ansbury village, which is today's North Germantown hamlet. And uh, a lot of Petris went out to the Mohawk Valley, but a tremendous amount of Petries also stayed in Southern Columbia County. Uh, there's sections of the town of Livingston, uh, New York. If you look at maps from the 1800s, there's just a tremendous amount of Petries uh, scattered all over. Um, well, while I'm in the Mohawk Valley, I'll quickly touch on uh, Adam Helmer's run, uh, which was memorialized in the uh, 1936 film, Drums Along the Mohawk. Um, this happened in 1778. Like I said, in the Mohawk Valley, it was truly a civil war. There were no other really large battles after the Battle of Oriskany, but there was a lot of raiding, uh, a lot of small scale, things small-scale skirmishes and raids. And uh, Joseph Brandt was a Mohawk, partially a Mohawk Indian. And he had a, a contingent of Mohawk Indians and loyalists uh, that were basically on a, on a raiding party heading for the town of German Flats in the Mohawk Valley. And Adam Helmer's run, it's not documented on paper anywhere on the from the time, but it's it's one of those stories that's been handed down through family, multiple family lines have reported that oral history. And that's why when it came time for the Pomeroy Foundation to put up a sign, it's a legends and lore sign, as opposed to one of the regular signs. Uh, they're very uh, particular about primary sources to verify every piece of information that goes on these signs. However, if it's more of like an oral history, more of a legend, they will do these red signs called legends and wars signs. Now, Adam Helmer uh, was a grandson of Philip and Elizabeth Helmer, and they both lived in West Camp, uh, so across the river in the area, uh, just a little bit north of today's Socrates. And uh, by 1716, 1717, they're in Newcastle in the Schoharie Valley. And you know, eventually made their way onto the Mohawk Valley. Uh, 
Uh, this gentleman here, Frederick Augustus Conrad Muhlenberg, uh, he's a grandson of Conrad Weiser, who I spoke about earlier. He uh, was born in Trapp, Pennsylvania, 1750, died in 1801, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, his mother was Anna Maria Weiser, daughter of Conrad Weiser. And his father was Henry Melchior Muhlenberg. Um, like his father, he was a Lutheran minister. Um, he became a minister, ordained, went off to Europe uh, to become ordained, which is not something that was available to American Americans who wanted to become Lutheran ministers at the time. He had to go over to Europe to study. And um, he became, he administered a few different places in Pennsylvania in his early career, he became the pastor of the Lutheran Church in New York City in 1773. And he left the clergy in 1776 to get involved with um, politics and also the war effort. Uh, he, was, he was a general as well during the Revolutionary War. Uh, he's also in the Continental Congress in 1779, 1780. Um, there's a famous story associated with Frederick Muhlenberg uh, from the first couple of years of the Revolutionary War, 1776, 77 area. He's down in Virginia and he was, he was preaching a sermon. He had his, he had his clerical robe on. And uh, at the end of the sermon, he said something to the effect of, there's a time to pray and a time to fight. And this is the time to fight. And then I very uh, dramatically tore off the robe and there was his, his military uniform on underneath. And um, if you go to the state capital of Pennsylvania, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, there's a statue of him taking, <laughs> taking the robe off. And um, so he also served his other, his most notable claim to fame is that he's the first speaker of the House of Representatives. He was elected to the House, the first House, uh, took office early 1789 and was the Speaker of the House that first term, 1789, his early 1791. And uh, he was, that's, that's when the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments to the Constitution were passed through the House. And uh, he was not the Speaker of the House for the following term, 1791 to 93, but he did serve again as the Speaker of the House of Representatives from 93 to 95. So that, that's really his, uh, his biggest claim to fame is, um, you know, is the fact that he was Speaker of the House, one, the first Speaker of the House, and also the Speaker of the House um, when the Bill of Rights were passed. Um, there is also a legend that um, a vote came up whether, in regards to whether English or German was going to be the official language of the United States. And According to the legend, he was a deciding vote no, but it's it's really not accurate. Uh, the true story is that uh, some German Germans in Pennsylvania requested that the the proceedings of Congress be printed in German as well as English, and uh, he did vote no to that. But it, the the idea of an official language was never on the table in that time. And, you know, like I said earlier, he's a, a grandson of Conrad Weiser, great grandson of Johann Conrad Weiser, both of whom were in East Camp here. Uh, the next gentleman we'll talk about is a uh, man by the name of Joost Height. Also known as Johann Joost Heid, H A Y D, is a little bit more accurate spelling of that name. Um, so he, I, uh, I reached out to Hank Jones today because it's it's unclear to me from the records and from his books where where exactly Joost Heid lived when 
He was in New York in 1710, 11, 12, and 13. Um, and there's no, there's no 18th century document definitively uh, tying Yost Height to any particular Palatine village. So it's unclear whether he's in West Camp or East Camp, and we don't know which village he was in. Um, but he was definitely in New York in those years, 1710 through 13. Um, he did have uh, a child baptized in 1712 and 13 as well by a minister working out of Kingston, New York. Um, another pretty interesting thing about Yost Height is that uh, his mother uh, in the Bonfeld Church Register, which is where the, his family came from, his mother is referred to as quote, uh, devoted to the Roman Catholic Church. So a little bit of background on the Palatine migration. There were a good number of Roman Catholics who went to London, to Holland, and then to, on to London, uh, along with the Lutheran and uh, people of the Reformed faith as well. Um, the, the British government was not going to send Roman Catholics to the New World unless they converted to Lutheranism or, or the Church of England. Um, they didn't want they didn't want a whole lot of in the way of Catholics in the New World. Um, so, at least from his mother's family, that's that's a Roman Catholic family that you know became a Protestant family largely because of the migration. Uh, many of his family did pass away on the journey. You know, a large number of the Hyde family uh, did not survive the trip in 1709-1710. Um, the photograph on the screen there is Pennypacker Mills, and the Pennypacker family acquired uh, Yost Heights Pennsylvania homestead. Uh, this is where he went with his family sometime after 1713. Um, the original house is in there somewhere, buried under many additions. Um, and uh, he moves on to the Shenandoah Valley in 1732. But the prior year, 1731, he acquired a grant for 40,000 acres in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, his homestead there is uh, pretty close to today's Winchester, Virginia. So he's often called the Baron of the Shenandoah, which is, you know, just a just a name. Um, there were towards the end of his life there were several French and Indian War skirmishes near his homestead. Uh, the homestead there. In Virginia, that's the home of his son Isaac, uh, called Bell Grove. That was built a little bit later than Yost Heights house. Yost Heights house, and the, from what I understand, the foundation ruins are still there on that site. He builds this house just shortly after they get there in 1732. Uh, this house is built a little bit later. Uh, so his son Isaac's house survives, his does not. Um, there were skirmishes, like I said, there were skirmishes and then uh, Braddock's army, uh, which if you've read any biography of George Washington, that's the first chapter or two or three of any Washington biography is that account of, um, of Braddock's defeat at Fort Duquesne and the young George Washington, his experience in that battle. Um, one of the other interesting things about Eos Tite's story is that his title to that land was contested for something like 25 years or more. The entire rest of his life, he's in legal battles uh, with a gentleman who didn't even live in, in colonial America. He was in, in England, but also claimed title to that land. And they both died before the legal issue was resolved, but it was resolved in favor of Eos Tite's descendants. And uh, 
he, he did bring along with him when he did move in 1732, brought several other German families from Pennsylvania over into the Shenandoah Valley. And many of those uh, descendants of those families are still there uh, today. Um, another interesting story about the Yost High homestead is that uh, in May of 1864, during the war, the, especially the town of Winchester, but really the entire Shenandoah Valley is kind of back and forth up for grabs uh, for most of the early, especially the first three years of the war. Um, Confederates largely had their way in 1862 under Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley. Um, in 1864, apparently uh, Union officers uh, had a headquarters at the Height uh, homestead and made off with some of the old family papers and documents. And uh, for that, that, re that is kind of cited as a reason why there was so much confusion and so much myth-making and legends uh, making regarding the Height family origins. Um, for many years in the early 1900s, the quite a few Height descendants claimed that they were French Huguenot descendants. Um, for whatever reason, that was that was seen as like a you know a, a more uh, desirable ancestry than Palatine German, um, but it, it's since been cleared up. But there are, if you read old sources regarding Ghost Height, there's going to be a lot of myth and a lot of you know, a lot of legendary stuff that's not necessarily true. And if you really go back in there, you're going to find genealogies that tie into the French Huguenots incorrectly. Uh, this gentleman here, George Henry Sharp, has always intrigued me. Um, I was a Civil War buff for a very long time uh, before I knew anything about George Henry Sharp. Um, he was a lawyer. Uh, lived in Kingston, New York, grew up in Kingston, New York. Uh, his father had moved to Kingston, New York from either directly from Germantown or with a stopover at, in Northern Dutchess County, possibly Rhinebeck. Um, his mother's name is Helen Hasbrook. And if you know your Kingston history, Hasbrook is a very prominent name in both New Paltz and Kingston. And that is a French Huguenot. Uh, family largely with a lot of Dutch uh, mixed in. Um, he's not very well known, but he did have an incredibly large role in the, the Union success in 1864 and 5 especially, but even before that as well. Uh, he, in the early months of 1863, when General Joseph Hooker had command of the Army of the Potomac, at the time Hooker took over command, uh, he was not left with much in the way of papers or intelligence or any kind of infrastructure to collect intelligence on the Confederate Army. So one of the good things that Hooker did, he was a you know, very uh, mixed record as a general, but one of the great things he did for the Union effort is he made a formal institution of the Bureau of Military Intelligence. And to head that entity, he chose George Henry Sharp. And um, a little bit later in the war, he, so after Ulysses Grant takes command um, of all the Union armies and is in the field for the overland campaign uh, starting in May of 64. Um, by the time they're down in Petersburg in July of 1864, a very bloody overland campaign. Um, it was the, a lot of the people in the Northern states were really starting to uh, be a little demoralized by the sheer body count. Uh, of the war in total, but especially that overland campaign. And um, Grant, for whatever reason, 
was convinced that uh, Robert E. Lee did not detach uh, a small force, relatively small force under the command of General Jubal Early. Um, Grant was convinced that Robert E. Lee would never do that and send Early up the Shenandoah Valley. But George Sharp insisted to Grant that he couldn't verify one way or the other uh, whether or not Early had detached off from the besieged city of Petersburg. Uh, when in fact uh, he did, uh, Jubal Early's uh, army went up the Shenandoah Valley. Um, they finally met some serious opposition at the Battle of Monocacy in the in the far lower, lower meaning further north uh, area of the Shenandoah Valley. And that was that slowed slowed Early's forces down just enough that uh, Grant could detach a full corps, send them up to Washington. And um, just in the nick of time, really, uh, defend Washington from Early's, Early's small army. And you know, what Lee was trying to do there was not so much occupy Washington, but to basically win a propaganda uh, battle by, you know, Grant had almost uh, largely destroyed Lee's ability to make war. Uh, the both armies were really beat up, but Grant could replace his losses and Lee could not at that stage of the war. So that uh, that whole episode um, caused Grant to really increase his level of confidence in George Sharp. He took him from General Meade's staff. Um, General Meade was still the figurative head of the Army of the Potomac. But Grant was Grant was in the field, so he was kind of just uh, reduced to a little bit more than a, a figurehead at that point. But after that, uh, you know, after early, after it became evident to Grant that early had gone up the Shenandoah, he trusted Sharp's opinion so much that he took Sharp off of Meade's staff and put him onto his own staff. And uh, the other really big. Uh, contribution to American history um, that George Sharp played was uh, the Bureau of Military Intelligence, which he was the head of, uh, was tasked with paroling all of the 20-something uh, thousand uh, Confederate troops that were in Lee's army at, after the surrender of Appomattox. Um, it was a very big job to verify everybody. Um, that Appomattox campaign, uh, Confederate soldiers were falling away rapidly. So they were at, the, at the actual surrender at Appomattox, there's, you know, so and so many thousand Confederate troops, and then a whole bunch of stragglers came in in the following days. And it took a tremendous organizational effort just to verify who was who in the Confederate Army because they had taken so many losses and reconsolidated units and reconsolidated units again in the closing months of the war. Um, George Henry Sharp was among Grant's staff that was in uh, the room at Wilmer McLean's house in Appomattox Courthouse, Virginia, uh, when Lee surrendered to Grant. Uh, there are some there are some written accounts from Sharp himself of that surrender. Um, Wilmer McLean famously um, had a house on what was the uh, first Battle of Bull Run battlefield and moved to Appomattox, Virginia to get away from the war. And five, you know, four years later, the final battle, you know, the final battle between Lee and Grant is right there. In, his house. Um, George Henry Sharp personally signed Robert E. Lee's parole. You know, he did uh, confer with Ulysses Grant as far as if he wanted to parole Lee or if Lee was going to face uh, charges after the war. And Grant, Grant took a lot of political heat for that decision. And Sharp did the right thing and made sure that he had had Grant's backing before he did that because it was unclear from the terms of the surrender initially whether it was going to apply to Lee himself or just the 
just the guys in his army. No, the, the sh sharp here, his, he was a great, great grandson of Jacob Sherp and Anna Maria, who don't know her maiden name. Um, they were 1710 Palatines, came to East Camp. They're in Queens, Queensbury, so the area of Sharp's Landing Road today. Um, George Sharp's cousins, second cousins, third cousins are the namesake of Sharp's Landing and Sharp's Landing Road, um, which still exists today. And he's, he's buried in Wiltwick Cemetery in Kingston, New York. There's a Thomas Nast uh, rendition of the surrender at Appomattox. It's in the early stages of the war, uh, George Sharp was an officer in the 120th New York Regiment. And years after the war, I think 1895 or 96, uh, he put up the money for this monument, which is in the old Dutch church graveyard in Uptown Kingston. You can still see that today as well. Uh, this fellow is a little bit off the, a little bit off the beaten path of history. Uh, James Willard Schultz, uh, he's in his time, he was a pretty famous uh, writer. Um, he wrote something like 35, 36, mostly nonfiction books. He wrote a, interestingly, he wrote a novel about Sacagawea, uh, the uh, Indian woman on the Lewis and Clark expedition. Um, he was, uh, for years, he was a guide in the area that's today's Glacier National Park. And there's many many peaks and other you know, lakes, other areas in Glacier National Park that are named after him. Uh, they're named after his, the Indian name that he was given, uh, Apikuni. So if you see that name out west, that's, that's named for James Willard Schultz. Um, like I said, he was a guide, a guide in that area and popularized that area and probably played a, a big part in it becoming a national park by popularizing um, he, he was first married to a Blackfoot Indian by the name of Nataki. And his only, the only child uh, of that marriage was Lone Wolf, uh, the, the son standing next to him there. Um, he was married a couple other times after she passed away, uh, but didn't have any other, any other children. Lone Wolf there became a pretty well-known artist. Uh, he did not have any other kids, as far as I know, either. Um, but it was this one was a little tricky to follow the path back to the Palatine migration, but um, the paper trail is pretty solid back to James Willard Schultz's great-grandparents. Uh, Johannes J. Schultz and Elizabeth Sutz, S-U-T-E-S. And they both lived in Stone Arabia in the Mohawk Valley. And uh, through using the Hank Jones research collection here at uh, the Germantown Library, uh, I was able to track him back to Johannes Schultes and Anna Barbara uh, Schultes. Not sure what her maiden name was. Um, so he's a three times great grandson of those Schultes Palatines. And uh, those Schultes has lived in Hunterstown, again, uh, the area of today's Cheviot Road, Hunterstown Road, uh, Woods Road. And uh, that members of that family did stay in Cheviot well into the 1800s, even into the early 1900s. Um, those Schultes that James Willard Schultz uh, descends from. Uh, they were in New Heidelberg in the Schoharie Valley by 1716 and 17. And uh, they bought land in Stone Arabia in the Mohawk Valley by 1733. 
Uh, the next Palatine descendant I'd like to talk about is John Philip Clum. Uh, he's in a relatively famous locally because he's born in uh, the town of Clawbrook, New York, uh, 1851, died in 1932 in Los Angeles. His big claim to fame um, is an Indian scout out west. He's uh, associated with the Earps, uh, Wyatt Earp, and the others. And uh, he's also the first mayor of Tombstone, Arizona. So he does pop up quite a bit in the old, old West uh, literature and novels and everything else. Um, his Palatine ancestor, um, he's a three times great grandson of Johann Philip Klum and Anna Margaretha Veronica, presumably Schaefer was her last name. Um, that Johann Philip Klum uh, on the, in 1716 and 17, he's in West Camp. And then he, uh, he comes over by the 1720s, he's in the area of Moscow. Um, and the, the other interesting thing about his Palatine ancestors is that original spelling of Klum has many different variations. If you go to look for it in uh, Hank Jones's books, uh, it'll be under Glump, G-L-U-M-P. Uh, other, other common spelling is K-L-U-M. Uh, the next Palatine descendant is a pretty colorful guy, not nearly as well known locally. And, in the locality that is well known, nobody knows much of anything about the Palatines. Uh, this is a man by the name of Sylvester Andrew Kilmer, also known as Dr. Kilmer. He was the, the founder of Swamp Root. And uh, I don't know how well you can read that, but that's a list of all the things that Swamp Root was alleged to cure. Um, I think he claimed to have discovered it in South America or something like that. There's all kinds of crazy uh, advertisements from the late 1800s when he started selling swamp root. This was a, a nationwide uh, product. Uh, there's plenty of bottles that survive today. Um, one of the other uh, thing one of his other business ventures was uh, san sanitarium in the mountains, also called cancertorium. Uh, this is if you're familiar with Interstate 88 in the middle of New York, uh, exit four, just a little bit outside of Binghamton, is called Sanitario Springs, and that town was formerly called Osborne Hollow until Dr. Kilmer built his his cancertorium there, and uh, there's just a one, one, maybe two buildings of that whole big complex still survive today, but the town is still called Sanitaria Springs. Yeah, there's his cancer, his, uh, his cancer advertisement. <laughs> um, called, referred to himself as the invalid's benefactor. Um, Claim to be able to remove cancer without the use of a knife, not surgical. Um, so you can see what this guy is all about. He's a little bit of a, a quack scientist. Um, this is really a, a, a big market in the, especially in the 1800s, early and then well on into the late 1800s as well. Um, if you're familiar with the story of John D. Rockefeller Sr.'s father, he was also um, claimed to be a doctor and uh, they sold all kinds of bizarre uh, cures and potions and pills. But it was a really big business. And uh, the center of business was Binghamton, New York. And those two buildings there, Willis Sharp Kilmer was a nephew, uh, both nephews of Dr. Kilmer. Um, 
Willis Sharp and Jonas M. Kilmer. Uh, they're both involved in the business as well. Those buildings survive today. Um, one, I think, is a synagogue, and the other is a private house still. Now, the, the Kilmer factory where they made all, this, all these quack medicines, um, it was a little bit north of this building in Binghamton. It burned down at one point, and then uh, the Kilmers decided to build a fireproof building. And this is, this is what they built. It still stands today in Binghamton. Most of that uh, decoration on the pediment at the very top of the building is, is not there. But otherwise, it still looks very similar to what it looked like then. Dr. Kil Dr. Uh, Sylvester Angel Kilmer's nephew, Willis Sharp Kilmer, uh, was the next in line of the business. And um, he didn't like how he was being covered in the local press. So he just started his own newspaper. And uh, within a few years, also built this, what's called the Press Building in Binghamton. Um, this still stands today as well. It's not as it's not in as good a shape as the Kilmer building, um, but you're getting the idea of just how much wealth this whole quack medicine industry generated at one time. Um, so, Dr. Kilmer, Sylvester Angel Kilmer, his Palatine ancestor was a man named George. Uh, Coleman, K-U-H-L-M-A-N, in the Hank Jones books. And that is, uh, that's like the, the earliest known spelling of Kilmer. Uh, George had two, maybe three uh, wives uh, over his life, and it's unclear which, which of his kids descend from which woman. Um, so we really just know that George is his three times, Dr. Kilmer's three times great grandfather, and his great great grandparents were Johannes Kulmer, by then the name's being spelled K U L M E R, and his wife was Anna Becker. And they were, they uh, lived in Hunterstown as well. Um, and eventually they wound up in the Schoharie Valley. And then Dr. Kilmer found his way down to Binghamton and he, he opened his business. Uh, the other interesting thing about Dr. Kilmer's nephew, uh, Willis Sharp Kilmer, is that middle name. It's Sharp because his mother's maiden name is Sharp. And he also uh, descends from uh, Jacob Sharp and Maria Becker uh, among the original Sharps here in East Camp. And then just a few quick mentions here. Um, Walter Chrysler didn't do too deep a dive into his ancestry, but I do know that uh, he did have Palatine ancestry in the Mohawk Valley. Uh, I'm not sure where they were prior off the top of my head, but they were among the people in the Mohawk Valley who were loyal to the crown during the Revolutionary War. And as a result, the family wound up in Ontario, Canada after the Revolutionary War. Uh, Walter Chrysler very famously didn't, uh, didn't have any interest in genealogy. People would ask him about his family and he didn't seem to, uh, didn't seem to have any interest whatsoever. <laughs> Um, Elvis Presley, the Presley name is a variation on wrestler. Um, the original Palatine's name was Andreas Bressler. And somewhere along the line in Elvis's line, there was an out of wedlock birth. So he's not a, he's not a direct male line descendant of Andreas Bressler, uh, but he is, he is descended from him.
And then uh, Ken Weatherwax, child actor, played Pugsley on The Addams Family. <laughs> and Frank and Rudd Weatherwax, um, their claim to fame was they were the, the, the they trained Lassie, the classic show Lassie. And then uh, the answer to the trivia question from earlier uh, is, so the trivia question is, who is the only US president descended from a 1710 Palatine German? And the answer is Jimmy Carter. And he's, he's descended from Andreas Bressler, uh, the same, same guy that Elvis Presley is descended from. And uh, came back to uh, Hank Jones's collection here at the Germantown Library. Uh, if you have any interest at all in this topic, that you really need to get here to the Germantown Library and take a look at what's, what's available to you. Uh, to use in your genealogy research. Uh, we're going to do an open house. Uh, Katrina will tell you the date here in a minute. And um, as far as the Germantown History Department, you can reach us at germantownhistory at gmail.com, on Instagram at Germantown History, uh, on Facebook, search for Germantown History Department. Uh, we have a website, germantownnyhistory.org, and you can also find us on YouTube. Uh, backslash German history. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, you can type them into the chat or unmute and ask me a question. We had a couple people replied for family members, um, cousins. So that's good information to share. Yeah, it's just going through. Um, does the library have any burial records at the Herkimer County area? I'll have to find well, out. Maybe. Yeah, uh, there's quite a lot on the Herkimer, well, Herkimer, in the Mohawk Valley in general. There's uh, 30 plus hardcover books and then quite a few more mm -hmm. softcover books. Um, as far as the collection itself, there's a uh, it's a little bit light on hardcover books about the Schoharie Valley, but there's a tremendous amount of softcover books in an explosion dealing with the Schoharie Valley. There's a lot, um, a lot on the loyalist Palatines, Palatines that were loyal to the crown during the Revolutionary War and ended up in Ontario. And um, there's quite, there's a good amount on the Southern families, uh, people in Yost Heights area, the Shenandoah Valley and quite a bit about the Palatines in North Carolina, particularly Burn, North Carolina. Um, so if you have any questions or you want to come live, that's great. But I'm going to throw out a couple of dates as well. So the open house that Tom was talking about with Hank Jones is going to be on Sunday, April 24th from 1 to 4 p.m. So that you'll see a flyer up on our website. And then our next virtual Zoom meeting um, with the with Tom is going to be on Wednesday, April 27th, again at 6.30 on the Road Jam. So those are our two upcoming. So if you're local, I know we have a lot of people on the West Coast. Um, maybe when you're visiting next, you'll be able to stop in and check things out. Um, visit both the library and the parsonage when you're open on Saturdays. Um, and uh, we also have fun. Um, June 4th, the Palatines to America New York chapter is going to have their annual meeting here in Germantown uh, to showcase the Hank Jones collection here at Germantown Library. So we didn't have any more questions. So we can okay. request one more time. If anybody had a question, you want to come off mute, you can do so or place in the chat. Well, again, we appreciate everyone attending tonight. everyone enjoy their day and hopefully we'll get some more spring weather coming our way thank you well have a great night everyone thanks have a good night